Got some new fan art this time. Last time I ran out of art, so thanks to everybody for giving me more. It all goes in a big folder, and when I'm feeling down or something, I peruse through it, so thanks for that. Anyways, I was looking through the Jehovah's Witnesses website, and I came across this article called The Bible's View on Divorce and Separation. Naturally, I decided I should talk about it. So let's take a look at how Jehovah's Witnesses feel about it. Let's get into it. Before we actually start reading, I just want to make an important distinction here. The name of the article on the website is The Bible's View on Divorce and Separation, not Jehovah's Witnesses' View on Divorce and Separation. Now, that would be fine if they were just talking about the Bible scriptures that reference divorce and separation, but they aren't just doing that. They're pushing their ideas and interpretations for them. So to be more specific, this isn't the Bible's views on divorce and separation. To be perfectly accurate, it's Jehovah's Witnesses' views on the Bible's view on divorce and separation. They like muddying the waters between Jehovah and the governing body, or the Bible and Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't like to let them get away with that. So let's see what they had to say for themselves. According to the article, there are three reasons for separation and only one reason for divorce. Let's start with the single purpose for divorce, cheating. It says, what forms a scriptural basis for divorce? Well, Jehovah hates adultery and sexual immorality. Indeed, he finds sexual immorality so despicable that he allows it as grounds for divorce. Jehovah grants the innocent mate the right to decide whether to remain with the guilty partner or to seek a divorce. Hence, if an innocent mate decides to seek a divorce, that one does not take a step that Jehovah hates. At the same time, however, the Christian congregation does not encourage anyone to seek a divorce. In fact, some circumstances may move the innocent mate to remain with the guilty one, especially if that one is genuinely repentant. In the end, though, those who have a scriptural basis for divorce must make their own decision and accept whatever consequences it may bring. Notice how they keep using the word innocent. The article is the entirety of Jehovah's Witnesses' views on divorce. I can only assume from this article that if they cheat on each other, they're required to stay together. I actually remember in my congregation a Jehovah's witness woman was cheated on by her mostly worldly husband, and she cheated on him as revenge for his cheating. That got her disfellowshipped, but she continued to go to the meetings the entire time and eventually got reinstated in like six months. I guess being shunned, hated, and ostracized for six months was worth it to get back at her husband. What a crazy situation. Anyways, in that case, neither of them were innocent, right? But the problem isn't that Jehovah's Witnesses will disfellowship you or something if you get divorced against their instruction. They just don't recognize the divorce unless you were an innocent party in a case of cheating. Which means if you continue on to date somebody else in the future, you'll be disfellowshipped. They'll still view you as married and cheating. I feel like this is a really important point to drive home. Here's the heart of the issue. What's the difference between separation and divorce? Because if you decide to divorce your husband, but you don't have scriptural grounds for it, Jehovah's Witnesses will treat it like you separated from your spouse, not like you got divorced, even if you went through all the legal proceedings. They'll continue to view you as biblically married. That happens even if you cheated on the spouse. The spouse can divorce you if they're an innocent party in the situation. You can't divorce them. If you do divorce them, then the divorce won't be viewed as valid by the organization. So ultimately, separation is nothing more than living in a different house. All the same rules apply as they did before. You'll still get disfellowshipped for dating somebody new. So according to this article, the rule is, if your spouse cheats on you and you're 100% innocent in the situation, then you can divorce them, not the other way around then you're free to remarry. The article says, in certain extreme situations, some Christians have decided to separate from or divorce a marriage mate, even though that one has not committed sexual immorality. In such a case, the Bible stipulates that the departing one remain unmarried or else be reconciled with the mate. Such a Christian is not free to pursue a third party with a view to remarriage. Consider here a few exceptional situations that some have viewed as a basis for separation. Okay, so now that we know what separation is, let's take a look at the rules for separation. There are three of them. Here's the first one. Willful non-support. It says, a family may become destitute, lacking the basic essentials of life because the husband fails to provide for them, although being able to do so. The Bible states, if anyone does not provide for dot 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 members of his household, he has disowned the faith and is worse than a person without faith. 
end quote. Notice the dot 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 there, the ellipsis. Jehovah's Witnesses put those things in everywhere. It's supposed to mean they took part of the quote out because it was irrelevant, but I've noticed a lot of the time they're just completely butchering the context to make the quote say what they want it to. So let's just take a quick look at what that verse says. 1 Timothy 5.8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Huh. So they cut the part out that says anyone who doesn't provide for their relatives. That's odd. Is it because it kind of completely throws off the point they're trying to make? Anyways, continuing on with the article, it says, If such a man refuses to change his ways, the wife would have to decide whether she needs to protect her welfare and that of her children by obtaining a legal separation. Of course, Christian elders should give careful consideration to an accusation that a Christian refuses to support his family. End quote. This is them saying, Elders should be suspicious by default. They shouldn't believe the claim by default. Continuing on. Refusal to care for one's family may result in disfellowshipping. End quote. Yeah, that's another thing about each of these. They're disfellowshipping offenses. It isn't like the guy can't hold down a job. This is a very extreme case where he absolutely outright refuses to do anything for his family. I've never heard of any cases as extreme as they demand to warrant separation for this reason. And it specifically says he fails to provide for them, although being able to do so. So my dad wasn't working when I was younger, and we were short on money. But this wasn't a reason to separate, because he was unable to, since he was in a wheelchair. Aside from that, I love how they're putting it all on the man. It's his job to work and provide for the family. The wife should be able to just sit at home and do nothing if she wants. The man should bring in the money and the woman should take care of the kids. In my family, my mom worked and my dad slept a lot. So anyways, they set the bar on this one really, really high. I don't know of any cases where the man of the house outright didn't want to provide for his family and it was extreme enough to warrant separation. The next reason for separation is extreme physical abuse. The article says, An abusive spouse may act so violently that the abused mate's health and even life are in danger. If the abusive spouse is a Christian, congregation elders should investigate the charges. Fits of anger and a practice of violent behavior are grounds for disfellowshipping. Notice they didn't say anything about having the police investigate or child protective services. They said the congregation elders should investigate and determine if it's worthy of separation not even divorce, but separated. If it isn't, they just go on about their business. The elders don't want police involved in internal affairs. They think outside governments are blasphemous just for existing, because it's Jehovah's rightful place as king of the world, and government officials like police or mayors or governors or presidents are blaspheming against Jehovah by attaining that office. That's why you hear Jehovah's Witnesses are so hesitant to contact police in cases of child abuse of various kinds. And notice the wording, extreme physical abuse. If your life is in danger, if it's extreme enough to get him disfellowshipped, then it might warrant separation. And for those of you who watch the John Seders channel, he did a video recently about domestic abuse and how a recent Watchtower article encouraged wives to stay with their husbands if the physical abuse isn't that bad. Said they should be better wives. All kinds of ridiculous stuff. So if you aren't at risk of dying from the physical abuse, then you need to stay with the person and work it out anyways. It's just a little abuse. Can't you be a better wife? This is seriously disgusting to me. On to the final reason for separation. Absolute endangerment of spiritual life. Let's read what they say about it. It says, A spouse may constantly try to make it impossible for the mate to pursue true worship, or may even try to force that mate to break God's commands in some ways. In such a case, the threatened mate would have to decide whether the only way to obey God as ruler rather than men is to obtain a legal separation. End quote. Notice the language they use in these cases. Absolute spiritual endangerment. Extreme abuse. Willful non-support. It's like they're trying to set up cases that will almost never happen. If you're in absolute spiritual endangerment, then it's probably already too late. There's one final paragraph here. Let's see what it says. In all cases involving such extreme situations as those just discussed, no one should put pressure on the innocent mate either to separate or to stay with the other. While 
spiritually mature friends and elders may offer support and Bible-based counsel, they cannot know all the details of what goes on between a husband and a wife. Only Jehovah can see that. Of course, a Christian wife would not be honoring God or the marriage arrangement if she exaggerated the seriousness of her domestic problems just to live separately from her husband, or vice versa. Jehovah is aware of any scheming behind a separation, no matter how one may try to hide it. Indeed, all things are naked and openly exposed to the one to whom we must give an account." End quote. In their defense, at the very end, they do say a wife shouldn't be ostracized if she does have to leave her husband. And if she was lying, we'll all sit in judgment before God for the decisions we make. I love how they frame it like the wife is always the one leaving the husband, though. They have this very specific image of how a family is supposed to operate in their minds, and they know it couldn't run any other way. These cases are set up to be the most extreme of the most extreme. My dad was physically abusive. He didn't work either. You'd think he met both of those criteria, right? No, my case wasn't extreme enough. Time and time again, my mom was told to go back to my dad against the advice of Child Protective Services. And she did, until she finally escaped him for good when he got a girlfriend about four years ago. That was enough to warrant a divorce. She's free to remarry now, but she probably won't. My case gave me post-traumatic stress. I have physical scars on my body from my childhood, but it wasn't extreme enough because it didn't literally endanger my life. Anyways, now we know in which cases it's acceptable to divorce or separate, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. Basically none. That's all I've got for you. Check out my Discord, Patreon, and all social media. Check out my science channel and my podcast. And check out the secret link of the day. It's my way of giving back to the community by shouting out a random smaller YouTuber every video. All links are in the description. Thanks for watching, guys.